The Nutcracker's Sweet, An Ever After Mystery, written by Shatona Havig, narrated by Krista Del Sorbo. Chapter 6 Though Milo hadn't planned to sleep, everything had changed when he'd walked into the Ellison's house. A steaming bowl of soup and a sandwich sat at the kitchen table, and a glass of milk waited for him. Milk. Still, Milo drank every drop, ate every bite, and even washed his dishes, all while the minister watched every move he made. Once finished, the man led him to a small room papered in blue flowers and with a blue and white quilt on the bed. It's not much, but it's comfortable and clean, the man assured him. It's swell. Milo swallowed. A man like this probably abhorred slang. And I just used abhorred in a sentence. Good training, Sister Agnes. Thank you, he added. I left a pair of pajamas there. The pants probably won't fit, but the shirt might be long enough to serve as a nightshirt. Nice way of saying since I'm twice as tall as you are, you can make do with half the clothes. Aloud, Milo just added his thanks again. I'll be out by six. We don't leave until seven. Join us for breakfast. Martha makes a fine breakfast. He wanted to refuse, but couldn't. He'd need the food to keep his wits about him. Well, thank you for that, too. The mammoth man. How had he not seen just how big the fellow was? The man stared at him for several long, uncomfortable moments and sighed. <sighs> Clarice is a lovely girl. Though he'd tried to agree, he'd never get it out without bumbling. Instead, Milo just nodded. I'd rather not see her hurt or murdered by organized criminals. Who would? Instinct told him that wasn't the right answer. Instead, Milo steadied himself before meeting the man's hardening gaze. I kept her alive tonight, and I'll do everything I can to keep her safe. He sighed when Mr. Ellison didn't relax. I think the important thing to note is that while we are innocent, the police won't see it that way. All we can hope to do is find out who did this and prove it. Otherwise, he couldn't finish. Otherwise, as far as the factory is concerned, Clarice was the last person in the same vicinity as Mr. Meyer. Yes. Gone was the man who had smiled at Milo's attempt at chivalry and protection. This grim-faced man stared him down for a moment before turning to go. Keep her safe. If you aren't a man of faith, become one and then pray until you can't think anymore, but keep her safe. It was a fool's promise, but Milo made it. I will. Lying in the bed, as comfortable as promised, too, Milo tucked his hands under his head, stared up at the ceiling, and willed himself to stay awake. A gentle knock woke him at half-past six. Breakfast in five, Mr. Natali. It was a woman's voice, not soft and deep like Clarice's. This voice could wake the dead, and apparently nearly had. Oatmeal, eggs, ham, and coffee. It wasn't lavish, but it was delicious. Milo promised to wash the dishes while they finished packing the car with their hamper, suitcases, and boxes. Mrs. Ellison came into the kitchen just as he put away the last fork, hat and pin in hand. Why, you're a handy helper in the kitchen. It sounded like an accusation in her strident tones, but the smile on her face hinted that it was meant to be a compliment. I'm so sorry we have to leave. Will you find someplace safe to stay? I will. In fact, he already had. The moment he'd awakened, the answer as to where to go had come to him. He'd be safe. Meanwhile, he needed to get over to Clarice's boarding house and be ready to follow her to work. Double sweaters did little to keep Clarice warm on her way to work the next morning. 
she arrived just as Mr. Gaines unlocked the doors, desperate to be warm by the time the other girls arrived. All she had to do was pretend she knew nothing until they figured out what happened. The night's dreams returned with each step through the semi-dark factory. The lights wouldn't be thrown on for another ten minutes, all part of Mr. Meyer's saving strategy. Take care of the pennies, Miss Stahl, and the dollars will take care of themselves. Clarius didn't believe it. You had to watch pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, and dollars, or they'd all mutiny and you'd be left with a sinking ship. In the painter's corner, she picked up the abandoned nutcracker and frowned. She'd forgotten about the order, forgotten that Mr. Topo expected those dolls today. This morning. Of course, the order was Topo's, She'd always assumed it, but last night Milo had said he'd been sent to ensure it. Proof. And if I don't get them done, will they come after me next? Her dreams of sitting on her hands to warm them for the next ten minutes vanished. Instead, she tucked the white paint jar between her knees and rubbed the pink jar between her palms, shook it, and rubbed some more. Only once she was certain it was warm enough did she pull out her pouncing brush and go to work. Instead of her usual one-doll-at-a-time approach, she painted the cheeks on every one of the nutcrackers before cleaning the brush and moving on to the next. There'd be no need for that kind of assembly line approach with her being the only one painting faces, but if it increased her speed at all... Mary arrived first, tall with cropped hair like so many of the girls these days, she wasn't exactly a pretty girl, but there was something lively and vivacious about her. You're here early. Her jaw dropped in an exaggerated move. Unless you didn't have to work all night. No, I left before I finished. I'm working like crazy now to catch up so Mr. Meyer isn't angry. You left? Clarice couldn't decide if the girl was shocked or impressed. She just nodded. I couldn't stay another minute. Brush clean, she moved to pick up the round-tip sable she used for the teeth and removed the white paint jar from between her knees. Just in time, she remembered to tuck the pink paint there for when she was ready to do the lips. To deflect conversation, she added, You're here a bit early, too. My, uh, brother was coming this way, so he dropped me off, saved me a ride on the trolley. That was nice of him. Mary looked ready to ask another question, but Clarice beat her to it. You haven't mentioned your brother before. What does he do? He's, uh, well, he investigates things. He's not allowed to talk about it much, so I don't know a lot. Their conversation was interrupted by Mr. Gaines. Clarice, will you come with me, please? She frowned but stood, forgetting the paint jar. It crashed to the ground, and paint splattered over her shoes. I suppose I won't be resoling these. Mary rushed to help clean up the mess and offered to do the teeth for her. I'll get them done for you, Clarice, I promise. As they left the corner, Clarice looked back to see Mary staring down at the odd wooden dolls. She's very sweet, isn't she? Who? Mr. Gaines followed her gaze before saying in his smooth, gentle twang, Oh, Miss Mary, yes, quite. At the stairs to the offices, Clarice caught her breath. The sounds and smells of the previous night rushed at her. The memory of being bowled over mingled with something she hadn't been conscious of at the time. Peppermint. The man who nearly knocked me over. He smelled like peppermint. Just this way, Miss Clarice. There are a few men here to speak to you. Men? She froze and stared back at him. What men? They're from... He swallowed hard and perspiration beaded on Clarice's upper lip. Her hands went clammy. Mr. Topo, I need to refuse. To run. But how? Well, I think they can explain better than I can. He knows. Did they tell him? 
Mr. Dalton sat fidgeting at his desk in the reception area of Mr. Meyer's office. On either side of the room, two men in suits and two policemen stood waiting. Mr. Gaines introduced her. This is Miss Clarice Stahl. She was the one working late last night. The shorter of the two men in suits stepped forward, hand outstretched. He was stockier, too. A bit pudgy, but not much. A grim line stretched across features that seemed to naturally want to smile. Interesting. I'm Detective Lombardi. A quick, firm shake followed before he gestured to the other suited man. Detective Doyle. A grin he couldn't repress followed. Not related to the famous detective author. Lombardi. But despite the protest, that man gave a weak smile as he offered his hand as well. Lombardi gestured to the two uniformed men and said, Officers Murphy and Yates. It's, um, nice to meet you all, of course. Clarice swallowed her rising panic and cast about in her mind for what she might normally ask when abruptly introduced to police officers. It came to her in an instant. Have I done something wrong? Only weak chuckles replied at first. Then Doyle spoke up. I hope not, Miss Stahl. However, since you may have been the last to speak with Mr. Meyer. Last to speak with him? We understand you stayed late to finish an order. Could she do it? Could she lie to the police, even to protect Milo and possibly herself? Her gaze traveled from one man to the next and finally landed on Mr. Gaines. What is he saying? Didn't you see him when you brought me his note? Yes, but when you finished... At last, and out. I didn't finish, and I never spoke with him last night. There. At least that was true. You didn't? The detective looked first at his partner and then at Mr. Gaines. When did you leave, sir? I was one of the last to leave. Meyer would have locked up after Miss Clarice finished. He didn't? Clarice asked. I called out to him, but he never answered, so I left. Surely once someone saw that I was gone. Detective Lombardi turned the knob to Mr. Meyer's office, and Clarice had to fight back nausea at the mental picture of Mr. Meyer lying there next to that broken nutcracker. Oh no, the nutcracker. It'll look like I'm responsible. Will you step in, please, Miss Stahl? Every instinct demanded she run. She knew where to go now. Down the catwalk, out to the fire escape, across to the alley and down behind the barrels. They'd never look there, if only she could make it. As if propelled by a wind-up spring, Clarice followed him into the office. Her nose wrinkled before she could hope to control it. In case the man saw that, she turned to him. What is that odor? It's revolting. Whiskey, Miss Stahl. The room reeks of it. Was Mr. Meyer a heavy drinker? I should say not. She turned to him, indignant. While Clarice may have doubted the previous night, now she felt certain. That whiskey did not belong to Mr. Meyer. She turned to Mr. Gaines and called in Mr. Dalton. Tell them, tell them you never saw Mr. Meyer touch the stuff. It's illegal for goodness sake. Haven't you heard of that little thing called the Volstead Act? Don't overdo it, Clary Stahl. They'll suspect something. In case it helped, she addressed Mr. Gaines again. Should we be in Mr. Meyer's office without him here? He really doesn't like it when people are in here she explained to the officers and the detectives. Detective Lombardi, hat in hand, had it always been there or had he just removed it? She didn't know, but he rotated it once before meeting her gaze and saying, I regret to inform you, Miss Stahl, that Dietrich Myers was found dead in a suite at the Chesterfield last night. Dead? A hand covered her mouth, and Clarice even felt her eyes go wide without any instruction from her. At that moment, she saw it. The broken nutcracker. 
Her mind whirled at dizzying speeds, but she didn't have time to give each thought due attention. She had to think fast, act fast. Why is that nutcracker on the floor? Who broke it? She blinked and looked up at him, and tears formed. Mr. Meyer is dead? How? To her relief and her disgust, she swayed. I think I need to sit down. The morning air bit at him as he strolled a block behind Clarice all the way from the Blackwood District over to Meyer's factory. The poor girl must be freezing. Aside from that sympathetic thought, the rest of Milo's would have cut pretty deep if he'd allowed them to fly. As far as he could see, she didn't pay attention to a single person or vehicle that passed. Not cars, not trolleys, and not even the few wagons that still filled the section between Blackwood and the old dry docks area of Rockland. Following on the trolley, not as easy as on foot, he'd clung to the outside and hoped the conductor wouldn't complain. How she made it to the factory without him seeing a single car that made him twitch could only be chalked up to those prayers Mr. Ellison had insisted he pray. The only thing was, he hadn't. Still, maybe the man had, or maybe God really did watch out for good people. And you're not a good guy, so he's not watching out for you. Once she made it safely in the gates, only a little blue from the cold, he decided, Milo went across the street to the pathway between buildings and leaned against the wall, ready to drop behind the barrels at the side of the wrong cars. It would be a long wait, but he had nowhere else to be, not until he could talk to her. They'd figure this thing out. And you will speak like a man instead of a kid in trouble this time. His confidence wavered as a Packard pulled up to the factory. A police Packard. An hour later, what was left of it plummeted to the pit of his stomach at the side of Clarice's hat in the back window as the car pulled out of the yard and sped away. I can't see her now. I have to figure this out by myself. Tune in tomorrow for the next chapter. Thanks for listening.